This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers, and joining us this week is returning guest and friend of the show. She's a singer, composer, writer, football blogger, <laughs> um, uh, Carrie Andrew. And I would start reading down her resume, but she's involved in way too many projects <laughs> uh, for me to possibly do that. But And since she's here, I figure we might as well ask her. Carrie, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me again. <laughs> it's it's great to have you back. But before we even get started on anything else, we need to get something very important cleared up. Do we even <laughs> care that uh, David Beckham retired? Um, I felt a little melancholy uh, really? because I basically he's basically my second husband, uh, <laughs> and I will always love him. Uh, yeah, it's it was it was news on this side of the pond at least. I mean, it's not exactly a surprise, but uh, at least over. Well, maybe not everyone, but he's still he's still revered as as a footballer and not just a matinee idol slash <laughs> I don't know million, billionaire model well, man. That actually <laughs> answers my question. I I'm glad we got that for, cleared up. For a true football fan, does he still hold up as a player and have respect in that sense, or did? He oh well, uh, for an England fan, you can't really forget this this um, uh, you know a couple of amazing games he played for us. Uh, uh, in the, the mid 2000s, where he was just our true captain and warrior of English hearts. <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry to have uh, started off with that. I just know that Kerry's a big football fan and and cool European football, not lame American football. This is a this is a music show, right? Did I go what? to the wrong Skype chat? Oh, yeah, so, you did. <laughs> so the reason why Every I invited time. Carrie onto the show this time around is that I saw she has a new chamber opera being premiered in July, along with a bunch of other things, and she's going to tell us all about those now, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I, I, I would love to tell you about those. Yeah, um, well, the Chamber Opera came about because uh, Wigmore Hall, you know Wigmore Hall in London? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they, they say it's Europe's finest chamber music venue, so there we go. Um, and it's uh, they, the amazing education department there. They wanted to celebrate Benjamin Britten's centenary year. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on in this country to celebrate the amazing canon of work that Britain uh, produced. And, and they wanted uh, to um, commemorate his centenary by thinking about all the music that he wrote for young people and for people in the community uh, because he wrote such great stuff for kids to sing and uh, Neuer's Flood, one of his uh, his operas, and, and lots of other stuff. So they wanted to commission um, over three years, three different composers to write a, a piece that would involve lots of members of the community uh, in the heart of London. So that's how it came about. And uh, yeah, I was asked to write this this piece uh, to involve about 150 um, members of the borough of Westminster in London. So they're aged about nine to 80. Um, with three schools and a community choir and then a group of older adults who uh, mostly do local history, but we've told them they're singing. Um, and then there's a, a professional tenor, the operatic tenor called Andrew Kennedy, who's very wonderful, and a five-piece band uh, who improvise quite a lot. Uh, so that it's sort of part classical, part jazz, part improv band uh yeah <laughs> so that's how, how do you fill one of those bands out i didn't you... know those musicians existed oh yeah lots of yeah there are lots of those in uh in the uk for sure i mean they're they're a special group and they're led by a, a vibraphone player called jackie walduck and who, who's very much come from an improvisatory um background uh and so yes yeah, some of them are much more classical musicians the cellist is uh, you know absolutely a classical cellist and uh, some of them come from jazz um, but they sort of meet they meet in the middle and they do these things called uh, one page scores so lots of composers write a one page score some sort of flexible uh, scoring that they can take and uh, work with and tease out their own responses to uh, over a couple of days and then that's that's their piece so they're called oh. ignite they work with wigmore hall a lot so they're the backing band. That sounds um, fascinating. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, um, the, one thing that's really interesting about opera compared to other kinds of music that, that we as composers are all uh, involved in is the level of uh, collaboration amongst all these mm -hmm. other people. And it sounds like this is even, even more than <laughs> the usual amount of collaboration. Yeah, How has it been working with all of these different, uh, these, these different entities? 
Uh, it's it's been amazing. I, I mean, I, I think I personally thrive on lots of different camps uh, coming together and me working with lots of those. So the idea was very much that um, the participants uh, from Westminster, the borough of Westminster, would have a hand in um, giving me some ideas that would feed, that would actually go into the piece. So I, I knew I decided that the piece would be about it's called Wood Woes and uh, that's the name of a mythical wild man in the woods. Uh, I wanted to use a, a folk story. Um, I, I mean, I love I love working with traditional folk music and, and Britain did, too. And that was my starting point anyway. So it's called Wood Woes. Uh, I knew there'd be this this wild man in the woods and this village who uh, discovered him and, and was very afraid of him. Um, and so I just took that very basic premise into these three schools and into the uh, adult community choir and the local history group of old adults and and started to talk to them about a few little different strands. So one of them was asking them what they were afraid of when they were children um uh or as some of them are children now of course um and that um uh, loads of brilliant monsters from different traditions around the world came out of that and i've sort of drawn on some of those um i got the kids particularly to invent wood woes i you know i said i i know it's going to be about this guy but you tell me what he looks like uh, how he lives in the forest what he eats how he communicates and there were some very, very wacky ideas. And I used some of those for the real wood woes. And then some of those, well, there's a scene in which they he's just been discovered and they're imagining lots more things about them. So I took in a lot of the lyrics about him being a zombie with blood red eyes, <laughs> gonna, you know, uh, get their throats and all this sort of, you know, really fun stuff that only kids can come up with. And then my favourite thing that came out of it was that... Um, just through through researching the idea of this this man in the woods, I read this brilliant book by a, a UK writer called Marina Warner called No Go the Bogeyman, and it's about um, the the male figure, monsters male figure in in myth and folklore, and and Woodways was one of them. And she just said something uh, in one of her chapters about lullabies and how lullabies, uh, even though they're sung to soothe a child, um, they're they're often they often have a sting in the tail. You know, they're often actually about the monster. Uh, that that they're trying to warn them against. And so, you know, if they didn't sing them, the kids wouldn't even know about the monsters. Um, mm -hmm. So I got really interested in the idea of lullabies. Uh, and so I asked everyone uh, to tell me any lullabies they knew, but particularly I asked the children to go and talk to their parents or even their grandparents if they're around uh, and find out a lullaby from their family history. And then I, the kids came back. Not everybody had one, but we had these brilliant lullabies from uh, Asmara in East Africa, from Lithuania, Kosovo, uh, from South Africa, from other different parts of Europe and South America. And then I got the kids, um, each kid just brought it in, uh, stored in their brain, you know, nothing written down apart from maybe some words. And then sang it to the rest of their class and then we all learnt it and I was just telling them that they were my new bunch of song collectors I thought that was really really lovely and so I found ways to use little snippets of a lot of those not all of them but a lot of those lullabies uh, so I gathered up all this information uh, a few little melodic ideas and sort of vocal soundscapes to do with forests and things uh, and then I just had this wad of paper and loads of recordings and then sat down in January and started to find ways to sort of piece all those things together. I, I wrote the libretto as well, which is really, really fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, just found ways to sort of weave some of those ideas in, had to discard yeah. some of them. But it's been really nice. The rehearsals have just uh, have been starting this week, and it's really lovely to see the children or the adults uh, looking at their their words or their scores if they read them and go, oh, I said that, that was mine. <laughs> that's my, oh my God, that's the one that my grandma said, uh, sang to me. And that's really lovely. I think it gives them a real sense of ownership over the works so and that when they uh you know come to perform it i don't know hopefully it, it makes it quite meaningful for them rather than just us going hello please perform this piece yeah for Wigmore, if you know what i mean <laughs> well and, and think of how productive britain could have been if he had had a group of mm. little kids to crowdsource <laughs> finding all of his folk songs <laughs> right send yeah. them out into the world <laughs> find find your family's folk songs kids Absolutely. it would have been he would have written so, so much music that way <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it strikes me that that's a really uh, a, a nice tribute to Britain and his his relationship. Not not only um, as as you you said with kind of that outreach children's mm, music yeah. educational kind of music, but also um, incorporating those f folk songs, which yeah, I, I guess yeah. is part of that in a lot of ways is giving people something that is in some at least 
some small way and maybe in larger way familiar to them and they, they already feel a connection to. Yeah, well, I, I found that, I mean, things that came up, uh, there were there were folk songs, some, some from around the world and some from uh, from the UK that people did recognise, especially the older generation. Um, and that was really lovely. I'll tell you something really nice that happened was that in the, the small group of, of older singers, uh, there was a guy called there's a guy called Robert, and he's from the northeast of England, and um, he's uh, got Alzheimer's disease. But um, as you might know from uh, anyone who has Alzheimer's disease, often they can remember songs really, really well. And the the ladies would ask, "Say, go on, Robert, sing us a song." And he'd come out with the uh, you know they just have to give him a couple of lines, and he'd sing sing a song. And one of them was uh, an English folk song called uh, "Early One Morning." You know, early one morning, just as the sun was rising. Um, and uh, he sang that. And I thought, I've got to use that somehow. And, and I find I find a way to use that in, in the opera. And that's particularly good because I know that Britain set that one. So it just seemed perfect. That was the first song that I heard this guy sing. Um, it seemed very meaningful. So hopefully that's going to be my weepy moment at the end. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody starts bawling their eyes out. <laughs> So um, now the level of community engagement you seem obviously to be going for here, is that something that um, when you were approached about the project that, that they wanted to have oh, or yeah. was yeah. that your choice? No, no, this is uh, Wigmore Hall has the most fantastic uh, education and learning program. and uh, But I, th I think maybe there's also quite a culture of that in, in the best um, institutions that, that send people like me, freelancers. I mean... I, I, I worked on this as a composer, but I've often gone and done workshop leading um, instead of just being a composer in those sort of uh, for those sort of organisations. And a lot of them do projects in which it's about co-creating work uh, with usually young people, but or with with the community people you are working with. But no, that very much came from uh, uh, Wigmore Hall. It was their idea, but something that I was I'm very used to doing and really really happy to do. I think it makes it much more worthwhile for them, really rather than just, like I said, just presenting them with a score, saying, please sing this for us. Absolutely. And I think you, <laughs> you, you ensure yourself a good opening night by having 140 performers. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, we actually, every aunt, got, we've got two performances, so we should be able to sell it out, I reckon. <laughs> every every aunt, uncle, grandmother, father, mother, etc. if they're not performing, they should show up. That's it's fantastic. <laughs> That's yeah, just fantastic. Well. So uh, before we forget to mention it, the premiere is when? Uh, it's uh, July the 19th. There are two performances, uh, one in the afternoon, about 2.30, and one uh, at 6.30 uh, for those tired, tired kids. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting for the 99-year-olds. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have to look after them. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> So what what has the reaction been like uh, to the music from the the members of the community that are hearing it for the first time? I, I wouldn't imagine that they perform a lot of recently composed music. Well, um, I, the reason I was asked by Wigmore Hall, uh, they said this to me, was that they they knew I'd be someone who wouldn't write something that was purely contemporary classical they wanted especially with the band i was telling you about they wanted right. someone who could write something that maybe had elements of classical new classical music and maybe jazz and improv and folk and well that's just me all over so i mean i was always writing something in which the the vocal lines for those kids uh, and for those adults have to be singable have to be memorable um, but obviously i try and give the instrumentalists uh, rather more more complex things to do here and there um so uh i've i mean i always i'm always really interested in trying to get vo uh, vocalists to amateur vocalists to do something they haven't possibly done before so i'm interested in extra vocal sounds and percussive sounds and textural sort of soundscape stuff so i've tried to get some of that in um but there, there's nothing you know there's not like loads of really angular lines or anything like that i mean there would be no point they'd be really hard to learn they've got <laughs> hardly any time to learn it um but yeah basically there's there have been really nice reactions it's been really lovely and they seem um, pretty open to those those funny sounds that you're asking them to make uh yeah totally well because again because we went in there uh, at the beginning and i basically you basically say hell we need your help you know yeah. i've got these little ideas and i'm not really sure how to put them together so what happens if we do this and this and this? Oh, wow that's it that's what i want and uh, that's that's how you do it <laughs> yeah um 
so yeah yeah uh soundscapes and and percussive stuff is, is the way to go for this sort of a project i think and andrew kennedy who's the one professional tenor he's got he's got some juicy uh, and slightly more difficult stuff to do so i sort of let it i uh, let it all out in his part really. yeah. <laughs> is uh are there plans or is the music generally amenable to um making sort of a concert version of it do you know mm. what i mean yeah, well, it'll be interesting. I mean, it's very much tailored at the moment. It's you know, it's tailored for the these this particular band, five piece band of part classical, part jazz, part improvising musicians. But I think uh, other musicians will do that too. Um, I that would be interesting. I mean, to be honest, it's it's a, a big challenge for Wigmore Hall and this wonderful director I'm working with, Hazel Gould, to make something. Uh, operatic and theatrical in Wigmore Hall it's got a it's a chamber music venue it's got a small stage there you can't black it out you know you can't uh just uh use use lighting in there so it's quite a challenge to uh, like make the whole thing um theatrical and turn it into a forest in a village anyway so actually I think it could work I'd like to think it could work as a concert version we'll see we'll see what it's I hope it has a, a good legacy afterwards and can go on elsewhere well, certainly it's going to be video and audio documentary, oh, I hope. Of course, yeah. In All fact, right. we've got a couple of lovely uh, documentary filmmaker students filming the whole thing and the making of and everything oh. else. So, oh, that's yeah, great. It's well documented. That's great. Mm. You know, we, 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 uh, we've had a good friend of ours, Rob Deemer, a composer on the show a number oh, yeah. of times. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has a project that he's working on where he's interviewing a bunch of different composers from all over the place and doing all different yeah. kinds I've of styles. I've been interviewed by him. That's why I know oh, his name. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I've done one of those. <laughs> well, so then you know what we're talking about. And yeah, I do. When 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 we talked to him about this project, or he actually wrote about this in his column on New Music Box, that one common thread that he has seen through nearly all of the interviews that he's done with composers is that when he asks them about the projects that they would like to pursue in the future, almost all of them say that they would like to be writing opera. <laughs> and he found that to be really surprising because mm -hmm. of the reputation of opera companies for being yeah. re relatively stodgy and conservative. Um, and one of the one of the things that mm -hmm. struck me when I read about that is that I think a lot of composers today want to write operas, but in their mind, what they are calling an opera is a very different kind of thing for each of them. Yes, um, and something yeah. like what you're doing strikes me as something in that in that vein. I'm sure that's very very true because uh, I'm I'm very excited to call this my first opera. I wrote a big piece a few years ago from the end of my PhD, but um, and that was a sort of opera of sorts. But this this is this is called an opera, and it's a Wigmore Hall, so it's an opera. But yeah, it's an opera with tons of kids who are singing uh, as kids do. Um, and it's got a five piece band and, you know, it's, it's all sorts of sort of strangeness. But yeah, um, opera is I have a funny relationship with opera, really. I mean, I, I don't really enjoy the more conventional end of opera very much and, and never really have. Um, I go and see new new operas and I just don't tend to just don't tend to enjoy very many of the, the more conventional end of them. But I have a real problem. I'll let it all out now. I might as well. I have a real problem with the way that a lot of composers uh, write, write for voices. I mean, I'm talking about those angular lines before, but, um, you know, the most important thing in an opera uh, is making sure that the words are heard if there are words well you need to know what they're saying what they're singing about all the time and far too many operas uh, need subtitles and uh, have really heavy orchestration underneath it so you can't hear what they're singing anyway you haven't got a hope of it and I mean, that's, that's my big bugbear of the more conventional end of opera but you're right opera can mean lots of different things for different people and really all it should mean all it should boil down to is is uh is singing and drama i don't know some sort of theater and even a story do you even need a story not necessarily uh, you need some voices and some sort of theater I, I guess that's what i'm more interested in voices within a theatrical context yeah uh is is definitely my interest in my world and i'm sure that's what I'm sure that's what most people say, although there's perhaps just, just something very grand about writing an opera. And perhaps for most people, that's the pinnacle, because that could mean, uh, you know, a big cast of soloists and a chorus and an orchestra and playing for nights and nights. You know, maybe that right. is, is the big peak. Um, but for me, it's uh, it, it means it means something different or it means something much broader 
uh, which is, yeah, voices in theatre, not necessarily big costumes and shrieking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think I think Sam would agree with you on the on the shrieking. I can see him punching the air. So yes, <laughs> uh, I'm glad I'm just not the only one. And you have uh-huh. a leg to stand on because you're a singer too. So normally Woo! it's just yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. me. Um, well, and I think like, the I singing Bill Canto style singing. I think the singing yeah, style I'm, is the thing that makes it. And a lot of times, that's that's the barrier to understanding is the style of singing, right? Um, no, that's a tricky one because I I've been working with uh, or actually being involved in auditions for another um opera i'm writing at the moment um and and auditioning lots of proper opera singers <laughs> and their words are just brilliant you know you can i know it's it's they were just being accompanied by piano but i i think i really do genuinely think that that there is a certain way of singing which yeah it can be hard to hear some of the words if you're singing bel canto style but really i think that the responsibility is down to the composer uh, to make sure that the the vocal line has enough space, uh, you know, within the accompaniment, and that the words are being set um, uh, sympathetically, whatever that means. It doesn't mean it all. Has, you know what I'm, I just. I think you just have to be really, really careful, and I don't think enough composers actually really totally get it. Yeah, that, that as boldly. <laughs> no, that's fine. Carrie Not Andrew calling out composers everywhere here on Sound Notion. <laughs> You guys don't know how to write for voices. Sorry, Carrie said it. <laughs> I'm not naming any names, though. <laughs> no, ne- nor, nor are we, because we'd like all these lovely people to come on <laughs> yeah, our show yeah. sometime. Um, so tell us, you, you hinted that you're, you're, you're working on another opera already. Oh, yeah. What is yeah. that about? <laughs> well, this one's just, not even premiered, and you're already working on the next one. No, it's being premiered a, a, a month afterwards. Oh, my um, goodness. Because it's uh, being premiered by the Tete a Tete Festival, who uh, have this brilliant two-week festival every every August, in which well, it, it was set up initially to just put out to to be um, an environment in which composers and librettists could get together and just test out some ideas. So you they'd be hosting a lot of scratch operas, or you know, ha- half an opera, that. or one scene, or an act of an opera. But it's actually turned into a lot of very small, um, complete operas and so i was asked very nicely by them to write a piece to write a, an opera to finish off their festival and even though i was writing the other one i was like hey, yes please you know why not taking another one on um uh, because i do love it you know words and music and theater is just it's my dream uh and bill banks jones who's the brilliant very a bullion and energetic uh, head of the festival and a director said, what do you want to write it about? I was like, oh, um, I don't know. And he said, well, what are you interested in? And I said, outdoor swimming. <laughs> and he said, fine, do it about that. I was like, okay. Um, and he put me with a librettist. So I've never worked with a librettist before. I write, have set a lot of texts, uh, lost too many to account, uh, all sorts of texts and contemporary poems and medieval texts and all sorts, and written my own words. But I thought this is a time, seeing as that's what they specialise in, sort of, you know, matchmaking librettists and uh, composers. I'd put, be put together with someone, uh, Tamsin Collison, and uh, we worked for a while on coming up with a story, uh, which is about the River Dart, which is in the southwest of England. Um, there's a saying, which is, River Dart, River Dart, every year thou claimst a heart. And the, uh, the legend goes that the river has to take a human sacrifice every year, otherwise it will flood. And there have been big floods from the Dart and other rivers around there uh, over the last couple of years. So it's about the river, um, who's played by three, three ladies, uh, who, and they're in love with uh, a male swimmer who comes to swim in their waters and drama happens. That sounds great. And lots of singing. <laughs> that sounds great. So yeah. what, what was your experience? How was the experience working with the librettist then? Oh, it's been really good. It It is... I think I'm a little bit of a control freak and I love... That's why you're a composer. Words. Oh, right, okay. That would explain a lot. Um, <laughs> I, lo- I loved... I've, I've always written poetry and written... Just... I've always written. Uh, I loved writing the words for Woodwows, especially because I had all these things to gather up and draw on. Um... And so actually, in a way, in some ways, it was a challenge uh, working with someone else who had other ideas. Um, but what I'm absolutely rubbish at is is story, stories with the, you know, the right sort of dramatic peak. Um, uh, you know, I had some help on, on Woodways from from the director, Hazel, on just getting the story right, the words I could do, but the story. So that was really, really good. And actually, it's just really nice taking someone else's words and, and having to be inventive uh, with those rather than writing your words and already thinking about what music you're going to 
create with them. So it's been a really good process and she's been she's been lovely. Um, I hope she doesn't mind how I've sort of moved some of the words around and chopped them up a bit and uh, been a bit creative with them, but we'll see. Um, it's been really fun. <laughs> so so she hasn't heard what you're currently working nope. on right now for it? No. That's that'll be no, exciting. No, she won't hear until the rehearsals or the performance. We <laughs> talked about it a bit, but yeah, she just gave me something. I was like, "Thank you," and I've just taken it away and been very quiet and just sort of. Got <laughs> All on. right. So I'm curious, what do, what kind of stuff does does she write normally? I assume she oh, doesn't I, just write I, opera librettos. Um, I think she writes. She writes. Uh, she's maybe a playwright and writes all sorts of stuff and teaches. And uh, I think she does all sorts of things. But she does write quite a few librettos. Yeah, and has worked with the English National Opera and. All sorts of other things. So, interesting. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, that'll be very exciting. I'm, I, 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 I love the idea of opera. I, I am one of those composers as well who would love to someday write an opera. Though I, I also am not terribly interested in a big grand opera. I, I really love the idea of chamber opera. I remember discovering Samuel Barber's A Hand of Bridge while I was an undergraduate student, and I thought that was like the most brilliant idea ever. Was that a whole? I confess, opera... I don't know it. Oh, uh, it's this, it's a, it's you know, so it's it's this one room. I think it's there's four characters, and it's them sitting around a table playing bridge. Uh, it's re- <laughs> it's very cool. Excellent. You should check it out. I, it's it's yeah, this, it's all s- very small uh, instrumentation and just those four characters. Um, so I, I expect the scale of this new opera is uh, less. <laughs> it's less. It's about thirty minutes. And what's the perform? The, what's the runtime of, um, Woodways. the Wild Man? Woodways. Um, it's it's uh, fifty minutes. Yeah, oh, so wow. still not monstrous because that'd be that's enough for the participants to cope. With. Still, you're still premiering eighty minutes of music within a month and a half. I haven't written um, <laughs> Chamber Opera yet, so we'll see how many minutes it ends up being. I've been joking to people that the last 10 minutes of this new opera might just be drones and, uh, you know, right. lots of very re- repetitive cells of music. Improvisation. It's so flipping neck. Yeah, I'm going to have to work like the work like the wind to make yeah. this happen. But that's, that's fine. That's how it works. And, and that's <laughs> on top of all of your other projects. Um, yes. You've, you've, you're also a, 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 a great performer in addition to being a composer um and you sent us some recordings of a some new stuff that you you're working on now uh with and this is just you right your wolf yeah it's mostly me with a little bit of help from my husband who plays bass guitar um and uh it's called you are wolf and it's my uh folky guys which uh, that i've been doing for about five years, as I said before, I really like really like folk music. I didn't really grow up with it, but uh, since I was about twenty, I just got really into just traditional British and American, actually American folk music. Um, and You Are Wolf just came out of me wanting to start to explore that and use a loop station. So the whole idea is at least live that I'm mostly exploring traditional songs um, or sometimes traditional folklore or stories with original music. Um, but using a loop station and layering my voice quite a lot and sometimes having another musician or two along, alongside it. And yeah, I've just been uh, over this half of the year alongside the opera has been recording uh, a debut album, which I am now, uh, well, after this opera has been written, then I have to start uh, finding a label for it. Um, but it's been really fun. I've worked with a brilliant uh, musician called Magica, who's uh, a, a, uh, he's called Matthew Kerr, and he's a British musician based in Paris. Who I don't know if you come across, and it's a brilliant, uh, slightly experimental French pop singer called Camille, spelt Camille, but because she's French, it's Camille. Uh, she's really big in France and's done well in the UK as well. And um, he co-wrote and produced her albums and has worked with Nico Mooley. Uh, on remixes, uh, who else? Fever Ray from the uh, girl half of the Knife, the electronica duo, and all sorts of really interesting musicians. And yeah, uh, he's been working with the trio. I sing with Juice, and I got him to produce this Ewell Wolf stuff. Sorry, that's a very long answer to your very short. No, question. it's great. It's <laughs> it's a really interesting answer because really interesting music that's going on. Um, huh. And I don't, Sam. Sam, we were just listening to it beforehand. So uh, it's interesting. Dave and I were struck with the the insistence of the traditional sounding melody and how it just gets progressively um, 
This is just one track. Progressively more and more dressed up and uh, and shrouded by things. It, but it just kind of, <clears throat> affected by that, keeps plodding along. And it's, <laughs> it's a great effect. And then the other track we had is sort of loop sounding, which, yeah. um, you know, I also like. So um, there's some pretty strange folk that you're uh, writing about in this folk music interpretation. Uh, some, some strange folk. There's some strange songs. I, I didn't say that the album uh, is, it, it's come out of a project that I've been doing for the last couple of years, all based around British birds and folklore. So that was my starting point. I like themes. Um, it sort of helps focus me a little bit. And so I looked for songs and stories about birds in folklore. You get loads and you get loads in the American songs, that have, many that have come from the UK about cuckoos and wrens and hawks and ravens you know they're often there representing all sorts of things uh, and the cuckoo uh is an emblem of spring of course and um yeah there are some dark stories in there but that's what attracts me i think to them is that uh you know in so, in so much pop song uh can the pop song canon you know it's just so much about me me and you and, uh, we're a bit sad and love. falling out of love and, uh, um and <laughs> I know there are, of course, there are pop songs with narratives, but that you know, that they're, they're easy to a few, easy to pick a few out. Whereas all the folk ballads, they have these fantastic stories, uh, as murder and incest and uh, confused lovers and and boys being taken to go and fight overseas and lots of misery. <laughs> uh, they're just great stories, and I lo I love them. And so there's definitely a couple of good a uh, couple of good stories that I chose for the for the album. <laughs> the, uh, one of the striking things is that there's no hook. I mean, it's it's very yeah. memorable melodically, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, you kind of are into a pop music mindset because oh look, it's a female voice and oh there's right, stuff yeah, accompanying sure. it. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. So there's nothing That's to say it isn't pop music too hard, except it just keeps telling the story and yeah. keeps on and on yeah. and on and on. And you're like, where's the the two bar yeah. repeated thing that I'm yeah. gonna remember? There are you know, sometimes the hook. Maybe not in some of the ones that I've chosen, but you do often get uh, folk songs that have, um, uh, you know, have a little refrain that people can sing, but it's just not quite, obviously, it's not structured in the same way. You'll have a little verse and then it'll go, Benorio, Benori, and then another line and Benorio, Benori, or something, you know, little refrains that people can join in with. But yeah, it's just a, just a different structure, just a different form. So is there a live, uh, is there a tour of any kind to support this upcoming uh, release? Uh, yeah, give me time. Let me get the operas out of the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've been I've been gigging the songs actually for quite a while in uh, slightly different ways. Um, uh, I, I did a, mostly just me and loop station and bass guitar and, and just me playing assorted bits and bobs as well. Uh, but I've also been working with a string quartet and a clarinet, which sort of find their way onto the album as well. So there's sort of different incarnations. But yeah, I would I would love to in the second half of this year sort of focus a bit more on the performance side of my work and get out there a bit more with the UR Wolfie stuff, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking sure. of performance, is there anything new or upcoming for Juice Vocal? Because we featured a track by the, oh. that group as a pick of the week once and yeah. enjoyed it very much, and we want more. Oh, bless you. Well, yeah, it's it's our 10th anniversary year this year, which uh, is ridiculous that we've been singing together so long. So uh, we've been sort of celebrating that with a few things. Um, the, the next thing we're doing is actually next week, and uh, it's part of a a great festival that, that happens every half a year in, in London, the Spitalfields Festival in one of the oldest parts of London. <clears throat> and Juice are taking part in this uh, sort of promenade performance for um, quite a small number of audiences, but several times over in uh, slightly secretive locations in this part of East London. And we're in this brilliant house, uh, sort of part house, part museum called Dennis Severs House. And Dennis Severs was an American um, who was obsessed when, I'm not sure which bit of America he came from, he was obsessed with 17th and 18th century Britain. Um, and he his ambition was to come over to London and uh, buy a Georgian townhouse. And that's what he did in the 40s, I think. And then he he got this, this big townhouse uh, in Spitalfields. And then over the course of his life, he died in, in 99, um, he modelled it in, uh, he made it look like the, the house of a 17th century silk weaver. Uh, those are the people that, that worked a lot in Spitalfields. Um, and he inv like he invented a family that he said lived there. He got portraits painted of this uh, imaginary family. Um, it's a really weird place you go in there. It's and mildly it's creepy. 
Yeah, it is. Very, it is quite creepy because you go in and you think, oh, it's just a museum. This was a silk weaver's house. Uh, yes, okay, I understand, that. and they've just they've preserved it. But the, it it wasn't like that when he bought it. He totally over the years he would gather things and and sort of invent rooms and. It's very curious. I can't. Re- he he called it still life theatre, and there are all these little weird little uh, gr- yellowing notices around saying, as you go into a room, there'll be a notice saying, um, "This room is not dead." If you listen very closely, you'll hear the the footsteps of the occupants of the room that have just left. And there's like crumbs on a plate, and the smell smells and sounds are sort of coming at you as well. It's it's quite weird. And anyway, Juice are performing in there. Um, we're just singing some new music. Some it sounds new like a great music. performance space. <laughs> I think it will be great. It's a little sort of damp and creepy. Um, no, it will be wonderful. And um, a- another friend of ours, a wonderful composer who you should talk to sometime, Anna Meredith, who's just totally brilliant. Um, she's doing some electronica installation stuff over the road in a, I don't know, basement of a pub or something i'm not sure <laughs> and uh, a wonderful artist called elizabeth walling or gazelle twin who asked us to come and do it is also doing something somewhere else nearby and so the audience the bewildered audience will be led around these strange spaces and occasionally encounter some new music from some london girls wow. yeah <laughs> that's really interesting well we'll uh we'll listen to a little bit of uh you are wolf recording that we just talked about um at the end of the show but sam i think you were reading about one of your favorite composers this week am i right yes um his what, his what, his acts yes what's what's almost as awesome as getting to see mozart in person is of course getting to see somebody play mozart's violin or viola which are currently on tour in the united states first time first ever time, first time ever i heard that they were both spotted at studio 54 <laughs> no, I just this is the most ridiculous thing in the entire world, and I put the story. I think they here. they didn't they tour uh, hurricane damage in New Jersey. Yeah, that's it. They did a flyover. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous waste of resources regarding music that somebody could do. I put the story in the doc just so that I could make fun of it. It is it is pretty silly, especially since reading about it, they don't seem like they're like particularly spectacular instruments, and and were were it not for their provenance, they they would be completely ignored. Right. But and it's just some violin and some viola that <laughs> he happened to have, and you know probably owned much better ones later in his life. Right. So. Yeah. So they I are just, being played. The the, the, the violin are. and viola are being played. Okay. People are getting, but they just don't sound that good. <laughs> well, there's an NPR story where you can hear some interviews of people who got to play them and hear oh. excerpts of the violin and the viola being played, and they sound like a violin and a viola. You know? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, I am not the biggest Mozart fan. Dave was joking about that. So apparently, they're in a they're like locked in like cryostasis <laughs> under you know a huge armed guard most of the year and they come out for the the Salzburg Mozart Festival every year uh and this is like one of the few times that they've come out not for this like short period in Salzburg so you know whatever it just people go crazy for Mozart paraphernalia this kind of crap just contributes to the problem you have anytime someone who is you know, uh, not involved in music says, oh, you're a composer. What kind of music do you write? You know, uh, the whole Mozart is classical music. How do you describe what you're doing? I think this kind of thing <laughs> plays into the problem. Well, the, your, your next story ought to make you feel better. Yes. Um, <laughs> Carrie, you never answered me via email. Are you a Boards of Canada fan oh, at all? Uh, forgive me. I didn't. I somehow missed that question. Um, I, I like them. I'm not a massive fan. Uh, oh no, I heard their music recently, actually, because yeah, it's just been played I'm on the radio. Isn't it? It's fan. fine. It's not. It's lovely. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, it's... That's that's the highest compliment <laughs> that Carrie's willing to go to. <laughs> well, no, I, it is I, not I don't offensive. Know their music that well, it is not. It is not offensive. It's the kind of music pleasant. they do. The kind of music they do is, you know, it's not breaking any new ground in any kind of way, musically. Um, it's you know it's a a, a <clears throat> Scottish electronica duo that writes sort of what sounds to me like shoegazer music a lot. Uh, yeah. However, the the thing that's really cool about their newest album, they have a a very hardcore fan base. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was like two years ago, someone asked them, "Are you going to release a new album?" And they said yes, and they didn't say anything else about it. 
And then they started leaking little pieces of, you know, the music out here and there through lots of different uh, uh, media types. Now, this is not new. Uh, Trent Reznor did this years ago where he left thumb drives and bathrooms at gigs and stuff. Um, wow. The big difference is that they're using social media and they're a group that knows it has a big socially in, or media engaged, you know, social media engaged hardcore fan base. And they use that knowledge along with a marketing campaign such that by the time the album finally got here, we'd already seen little snips and snaps here, including uh, video content on YouTube. The Their fan base was just going nuts to get their hands on this. Right. Um, it's, it's worth hearing the NPR story or reading about it because they really do it right from a marketing campaign. And, um, you know, it's it's not something that's small scale enough like what Carrie's doing so that it has the, uh, the element of like community engagement. But it certainly does engage your fans in a way that that takes full advantage of what the infrastructure and the communication power that you have with social media and uh, any band that isn't doing it. <laughs> Or figuring out a way to make a really smart use out of their. This their seems like it's going over the top. I think to expect any normal band to do that is a little uh, unreasonable. Well, sure, they shouldn't do that. They should just keep doing the same thing they've always done, advertising their music the same way they do, and don't don't use social media as you know the way it's meant to be used. Just take the same promotional materials you always use and slap them on social media. Yeah, that's what that's I'm saying, should. Sam. You should just take social media <laughs> as basically the lamp post that you staple your flyer to. That's what that's what it gets treated like by most people. But this situation was not that way. Well, so to me, it, it's worth mentioning them. Sure, I suppose, but I don't... I'm always talking about you know how we we're interested in new music. Well, that's music that that came out with a, a re, it's new in the sense that it came out with a a very inventive and new way to get itself out there. Okay, that's Age fair. I think that is fair enough. I think I think a lot of bands and, and musicians in any genre could could look at the sort of thing that Boards of Canada has, has done and, and think of ways to apply it perhaps in a very different way. But I think, I think Sam's right. I think that's fair enough. You've got to try and be innovative and you've got to try and get your head above uh, the wall. All these thousands of zillions of bands, you know, and I think it's right. I, I, I once went to some marketing, uh, you know, how to market your band better sort of conference. And it's all about engaging your fans, getting your fans organized your army of fans organized them mm -hmm. um, i i i think it sounds like the right way forward <laughs> and, and right. it created a lot of social media hype because yeah. not everyone in everyone's facebook network or that follows everyone's twitter feed is also a boards of canada fan mm -hmm. yeah. but the ones that were fans started <laughs> pumping the content pumping the boards of canada content through their networks and that's yeah. how you create well, and so this music that they just released uh, is is going to be protected under copyright law, according to as the well actuarial tables, mm -hmm. as well it should be. Uh, it, somewhere around, so their the whole life, plus 70 years, so somewhere around the twenty mid-22nd century, right. you'll be able to make a derivative work without asking <laughs> for permission. Yes. Uh, and you may be surprised to learn, uh, if you're not, uh, a big copyright law nerd that the song happy birthday to you which i will not sing mm. is still under copyright well maybe here's the thing there is a company warner chapel publishing that claims that they own the copyright to it um <laughs> warner chapel has about a billion more dollars to spend on attorneys than anybody else who's willing to challenge them on that and so people just treat it like it's under copyright and they pay them money to use it um despite the fact that it was written at the end of the 19th century and in general we consider things written before 1923 to almost always be in the public domain with very rare exceptions um and even then if we're following life plus 70 we would still be clear for mm -hmm. uh for happy birthday to you today and its authorship is a little bit cloudy anyway right like, right how the exactly original publication was good morning to all and we don't know exactly how good morning to all morphed into happy birthday to you so there's a lot of questions but there is a filmmaker uh named jennifer nelson who is 
making a documentary about the song Happy Birthday to You, and she is filing suit against Warner Chapel <laughs> for their copyright claim on uh, Happy Birthday to You, which is fascinating. And she is uh, seeking to be to have the suit named as a class action and to have money returned to everyone that has paid a licensing <laughs> fee to Warner Chapel over the last several years. Yeah, uh, two million bucks a song. year, they estimate, that that, co- that wow. company makes off of Happy Birthday. Just Happy Birthday. Yeah, and the most tragic thing of all is that that song is terrible. <laughs> that song it's terrible. Is terrible. Uh, Why it is, is it what terrible? It is. It's, everybody loves Happy Birthday. Uh, What's so bad about it? If you'd never heard Happy Birthday before... And then you were introduced to it. Okay, that world doesn't now. exist. That it's world you true, just described yeah. doesn't exist. If you were introduced to it, having never heard it before, you would say, this song is terrible. You think? Yes. That and the Star Spangled Banner. It's easy to... No, no, no. Because the Star Spangled Banner is really hard to sing because it's a 12th <laughs> range. The Happy Birthday is like a 6th. It's perfect. Yeah. Everybody can sing can Happy sing Birthday. <laughs> Bob Dylan can what? It's if the range is so small, even Bob Dylan could sing it. <laughs> well, that's a stretch. Anyway, it'll be an interesting story. We'll see how how it goes. Obviously, anytime you're uh, entering the U.S. legal system, you know, pack a lunch. So <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll be back here in you know 15 years or so to see how that turned out in, on on Sound Notion 4036. Right. Um, it's just amazing to me that instead of just you know trying to involve lawyers so that she can use it for her film she's doubling down and saying i'm claiming justice for the world at large she sounds brilliant (laughs) yes this is really cool that and that song should be available to anybody to use absolutely absolutely so we'll we'll be paying close attention to that and now sam i think you're are you prepared is it time the pick of the week it is indeed time for our pick of the week, as Sam pointed out. Uh, and our pick of the week is, uh, did we decide which of these we're going to use? Either one is cool with me. I okay. Like both. Well, uh, I'll go with the, the, the buzzard's heart then from You Are Wolf. Uh, Carrie, do you want to say anything to set up this recording at all? Yeah, I would love to. Um, it's uh, The buzzard's heart actually sets a, a contemporary poem by a Scottish poet called Robin Robertson. Uh, he's my favorite poet. Um, and it, I, I wanted to use it because it has this line when the sun and the moon dance on the green, which is taken from lots of traditional folk songs. And it's in folk songs because, uh, that happens when someone's just asked uh, a boy who needs to run away or something, when are you going to return? And he says, when the sun and the moon dance on the green and that will never be. And so Robin Robertson has taken this line when the sun and the moon dance on the green and, and basically invented lots of variations of never. That's the idea. Every single line I sing really means never. Um, and it uh, features a, a great contemporary uh, string quartet, contemporary classical string quartet. Not that they're doing totally contemporary classical things here uh, called the Ligeti Quartet, London based uh, group. And uh, my friend Matt Dibble on clarinet as well as myself. <laughs> All right. So this is The Buzzard's Heart by our guest, Carrie Andrew, uh, in the guise of You Are Wolf.
just didn't want it to stop. I know. <laughs> so that I could that to like was twelve solid minutes of that. <laughs> that was the buzzard's heart by our guest Carrie Andrew, performed by herself, Carrie Andrew, as you are Wolf, uh, along with uh, Carrie. Who were those those players again? Yeah, it was uh, uh, the Ligeti Quartet and Matt Dibble on clarinet. Well, oh, was, not, you heard him. He comes later. <laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't get to that. Uh, but it's it's first of all beautiful singing. Um, but I, I love as Sam pointed out beforehand how you you have this very pure folk sounding uh, vocal line that is gradually more and more adorned by these instruments coming in, and then eventually the the instruments kind of almost take over and subsume the voice and you kind of just get the the consonants from the vocal line poking through the instruments it's a very cool effect i just i had in mind before i uh wrote this piece um of of two two gavin Bryars pieces actually of just of jesus blood never failed me yet and of bits of the titanic you know both very very simple pieces but I'd, I'd had to listen to Jesus Blood Never Failed Me Yet for some reason, and I, I hadn't listened to it all the way through for a long time. And uh, not many pieces make me cry, and I was just bawling my eyes out. And I just, I just love the way that he uses, he uses incredibly uh, simple bits of music, really, but through repetition and then, yeah, just the sort of layering and other things that keep coming in and adding to it, creates something really, really powerful. And that, that's all I wanted to do, really. I mean, the 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 album as a whole is broadly within folk and I didn't want to do anything that was too contemporary classical in sound so it's very simple bits of material each string part just has a, a different length uh, layer that's it and they just all keep playing that layer until the chorus and they have different bit of material and the idea is that they just keep improvising on uh, that's bit you didn't hear but they just keep improvising on it over and over until it becomes more free and more stretched out and just t- yeah totally takes over the voice because the voice is never returning even though I say I am. I never am. And that's the idea. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's I, 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 one thing that I think is really great about the the music from this the, that I've had the, the opportunity to listen to is that even within that, um, you know, the I wouldn't say the boundaries, but w- within <laughs> the the category of folk sounding music, you mm. find a lot of really great creative expression within. W- without making it sound like something else. Yeah, well, I I really like that challenge. Actually, I think of all the folk songs uh, as a template. I mean, they are. They're just it's just a melody and some words, and you can do what you like with that. I think. And I mean, I'm a real fan of of quite traditional folk music where you might just have a person singing sometimes with a, a guitar or, or a violin accompaniment, just singing through those those verses, and that's it. But I'm really interested in in teasing out other musical ideas or sometimes I write extra words or sort of, you know, other voices coming in or, yeah, different responses to stories or, or, or quite a lot. I've mixed like five folk songs in one together. I mean, there are so many different versions of the same song and I've sort of I've woven in different bits and found my own way through them. But, yeah, so I, th- I think of the folk song as a wonderful template. I mean, that I very much respect um, and I hope that at its at its heart, each of the songs still has... Uh, the the folk song or the folklore at its core, but yeah, I tried to be as inventive as I can. Yeah, we, actually, that, our guest, our guest last week, we talked about. Um, he he is influenced. Derek Brumell influenced by a lot of different kinds of music, and one of the things that that we discussed was that his music, when it when it has these influences of other cultures of music or other genres of music, it doesn't feel like this pale kind of imitation of this other kind of music that it's really absorbing and uh expressing through that channel the creativity that he expresses in all of the music that he writes and i think that's the case with your music is that you you, like you said you really have a lot of respect Mm. for this this great folk tradition and you're not just trying to kind of imitate the folk tradition but you're trying to create something that is a part of that as much as anything else is and it's yeah it's really absolutely i mean all all of my creative responses they all come from the song it's not like yeah i'm just gonna see what i can sort of hammer into this you know sort of put some other extra bit of genre or something uh, in there. So it always comes comes from just exploring the song and, and teasing out ideas from it. And yeah, absolutely. I don't want to feel like it, the, the folk song is cheapened or diluted in any way, but hopefully just sort of shining a, a light at it from a slightly different angle, perhaps. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Something I really enjoy uh, about that piece and a lot of different artists is the close miking. You know, you have an, a sort of an intrinsically more complex sound when you can hear all the little noises your mouth mm. is making. Speaking of close miking, Sam, could you get a little closer to yours? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you hear all the interesting sounds, and to me, we were dog, dogging Bel Canto earlier. Yeah. That's way more interesting than a tradition that grew up around making sure you can shout over the orchestra, you know. I'm very, very fascinated by um, the the two quite different traditions of, of broadly pop singing, pop, folk, jazz, etc., really, um, and the sort of trained classical style. I, I mean, I hardly teach any singing. I don't... I wasn't really ever taught myself, so I'm not really very good at teaching any sort of technique. But I teach a guy who's a jazz singer, really, but I'm getting him to do some classical stuff. And we just talk all the time about it. Actually, and Juice talk about it a lot as well, because since we were working with Magica, the guy who's who's produced my You Are Wolf stuff, I mean, he comes from the pop tradition and he's got us exploring our voices so much more and realising that, you know, that a pop technique is as much about technique as classical, it's just totally different things. So, you know, where you might want to sing the word sunshine as a classical singer, where you're trying to iron it out and make it sound as perfect as possible, that basically both of those vowels are actually are oh, sunshine, sunshine. And, you know, the, the consonants are just sort of dropping in. Whereas, I don't know, Le- I, I don't like this singer, Liam Gallagher from Oasis from back in the 90s would sing sunshine. You know, you're looking yeah. for the imperfections, you know, that hideous diphthong. Well, that's just what it is. That's... <laughs> That's his sound, and and I love that. I, I love a close mic sound as a as a solo singer. I mean, Juice as a as an ensemble sings slightly more slightly more classically sounding, but I really love hearing all the imperfections and yeah, the, like you say, the sort of the sibilance and the breaths. And I I think within the right context, it just it makes that voice very very real and and quite vulnerable as well. And hopefully that then can make an impact on its listener. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You, you just. <laughs> Summarize the Mercier's view on on vocal music. <laughs> no, but the thing is that v- v- all different voices have interesting different qualities. And what I'm really looking forward to with the, the the Wild Swimming Opera I'm working on at the moment is it has five singers and two of the singers are very operatic. Um, but I'm going to make the most of that. And the, the three singers who are going to play the dart are um, much more folky. They're, they're older mm. singers. They're folky. They're much straighter they don't sing opera and I'm, I'm going to be really excited to see how that contrast works on stage. So I think operatic voices absolutely do have their place. I just think when you have a whole load of operatic voices all playing different characters, sometimes that's not quite as interesting. No, that's really interesting. It, it reminds me of um, like Bolcom <laughs> calling for a country singer in <laughs> Songs of Innocence and Experience. Mm-hmm. Um, William Bolcom. Yeah, if that's what it requires, then that's yeah. what it requires. It's not just. And it's a different. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like asking for a different instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Right? absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. Beck has yeah. a song. I can't. I couldn't even begin to tell you the song. But Beck has a song where like the verse is sung by a rock screamer, and it's actually credited as rock mm. screamer. You know, and <laughs> yeah. that male ah, that kind of you know. There is. That was pretty good, can. Sam. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I like. I like. You either can or you can't do that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> You know. You, you know what else that, that reminds me of a little bit is um, the the piece that just won the Pulitzer Prize this year, Carolyn yeah. Shaw's Partita. Have you, have you, have you, have you heard that yet, this? Carrie? Um, I'm not sure. I have. No, I'll have she, to. Do, I, I don't know the composer. Right, cool. Her, no, nobody else had either. She's really oh, young. She's in her twenties. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? <laughs> um, it's it's called Partita for Eight Voices, um, and it's on Spotify and it's streaming on her cool. website. Um, so you should definitely check it out. But it's it's well. beautiful. Uh, for her her group is called Roomful of Teeth. Oh, I know, I know that group. Oh, yeah, okay. so that's yeah. her, and this is a piece she wrote for them. Brilliant. And it's 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 a brilliant piece. And the greatest hit that everybody has been playing, and it's the most immediately accessible and one of the shorter pieces, if you want to use a, have an example to show people, is the Passacaglia. It's really good. Oh, I really like I was going to say the Alamont, but whatever. Um, the Alamont's like nine I'll, minutes long, though. I'll yeah. listen to it all. Well, <laughs> there you go. I think we should probably leave it there. Carrie, before we go, um, I'll give you the last opportunity to plug where people can find you on the web and uh, what it, all the many sure. things you have coming well, up. I have do lots of different things. So the best thing to do is go to kerryandrew.net and that is just a, a, a hive for all my industry. <laughs> you can follow different <laughs> strands and uh, see what interests you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. 
Uh, and you, and you, I'm sure you've got all of your upcoming events linked oh, on there yeah, as well. Oh, yeah, they're all on there. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for being with us this week. It was great talking to you again. And you're, you're of course, welcome back anytime. If you've got something awesome like this, like this opera coming up, be sure to let us know because we, we'd love to talk to, about, talk to you well, about it again. And we'll be to very to curious you, to hear how both of these opera projects uh, turn out. I should um, let you know. So yeah, when when you get those videos, let us know if they're if they're available on the interwebs anywhere. Um, that's going to do it for this week's show. Uh, if you if you'd like to see any of the stories that we talked about this week on the show, or if you'd like to comment on the show, you can do that on our site soundnotion.tv/sn. You can also con- connect with us on all of the social medias. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. If you'd like to suggest stories for the show, you can do that with hashtag SN Weekly on the show. Uh, to follow us on Twitter, we're as a group at Sound Notion. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. And Carrie is at KJ underscore Funk. I like that Twitter handle. Anything that has funk is good. Uh, and you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes store, um, in the, I don't know, maybe we're in the Zoom marketplace or something, wherever finer podcasts are available. You can support us using the links on our site. There's a donation link and there's also an Amazon affiliate link. So when you buy your stuff on Amazon, just search for it in that little box. Uh, it won't look any different to you. We get a tiny kickback and, and uh, you can support us for no cost at all. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lab. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you back next week. Woodwows at Wigmore.